Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to MLS Live Virtual Planetarium. My name is Christina. I'll be serving as your moderator today. And although you can see and hear me right now, you'll mostly be hearing my voice later as our educators take us through a tour of exploring space. In just a few moments, we will meet our educators, but I do wanna go over some of the functionalities of our program today. So first off, if you would like to ask a question and you are watching on Zoom, you'll be able to do so by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And don't forget to include your name and age if you would like a shout out if your question gets asked. If you are watching on Zoom and you need captions, you can get those by selecting closed captions on the bottom of your screen as well. If you happen to be watching on YouTube or Facebook Live, unfortunately, we will not be able to see your questions or observations, but we're so happy that you're joining us today and we do hope you enjoy the program. But with all that being said, I would like to invite our educators to turn on their cameras, introduce themselves and get us started. Hello, everybody. My name is Talia. I use she, her pronouns, and I am going to be your presenter today, which means I'm going to be doing most of the talking, but I can't do this program by myself. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her, and today I will be your pilot as we explore space. And to get us started, um, what we're going to be talking about today is sort of a particular way that you can, that stars um, can exist in uh, the universe. And to get us started, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with a program that we use on our star shows uh, called Stellarium. This is a free open source program. It's really great at looking at the night sky. I have it set for tonight at uh, about 730. We're looking to the east. And what I want to do is show you a star cluster, because that's what we're going to be talking about today, um, our star clusters. There are a couple of different types. And you can see a couple of them in the night sky right now. So you may be familiar with the constellation Orion, Orion the Hunter right here, uh, famous for his belt of three stars. The belt's also a really handy pointer for what I'm about to show you. You just follow the direction that it points up through this V shape of stars right here, which is the face of Taurus the Bull. And it will point you to this a little group of stars right there. So I'll go ahead and put the constellation lines for Taurus and Orion up there. And you can see right here, a tiny little cluster of stars. Sometimes people think it looks like a little, 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 little dipper. That is a star cluster. It's a star cluster that we call the Pleiades. And this one's pretty obviously a cluster of stars. It's a bunch of stars pretty packed together in the night sky, but I actually directed you straight through another star cluster to get to it. So there's actually two star clusters in the constellation Taurus the Bull. The Pleiades are a pretty obvious cluster, but this V shape that marks the face of the bull, that's another star cluster actually. These stars are all very close together in space. This is the closest star cluster to Earth. So if you wanna go see some star clusters, uh, you can spot them in the night sky right now. Just use the constellation Orion. His belt will point you to first this cluster that marks the face of Taurus the bull, and then straight through to the star cluster, the Pleiades. So you can go find them yourself. Uh, what are they exactly? Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, show you some beautiful pictures. Both of those clusters, the ones I just showed you, are something that we call open clusters. So we talked about the Pleiades. The other one, um, the cluster that makes up the face of Taurus the bull, is called the Hyades. You can see written out on this slide. Uh, and both of these photos, by the way, are from the Hubble Space Telescope, NASA's premier eye on the sky. When it comes to studying star clusters, you can't get away from Hubble. Hubble is one of the major backbones of studying star clusters. So, um, like I said, this is a type of star cluster that we call an open cluster. And you can sort of see where that name comes from. These stars, um, there's, you know, they can have couple dozen up to up to like around a hundred stars in an open cluster and they can be pretty spread out. I mean the Hyades don't even look like a star cluster unless you happen to know that that's what they are. The Pleiades are packed a little tighter together. 
Um, they've got a little bit of wispy cloudiness around them. We will talk about why that is and where these types of clusters come from in a little bit. Uh, but these are not the only kind of star cluster that I want us to talk about today. So there are two major types of star clusters. Um, there's more than two types, but uh, there's two major types and then the other ones are sort of somewhere in between the two really. So this is an open cluster. This is the Pleiades and the Hyades, again, from the uh, remarkable Hubble telescope, but there's another kind, which is called a globular cluster. And it's also a very descriptive term. So you can see these open clusters, pretty well named, the stars are kind of spread out. Globular clusters are very dense, very packed, tightly packed stars, lots of them, hundreds or even thousands, up to millions in some cases, um, of tightly, densely, packed stars, kind of vaguely in a ball shape, which is why they're called globular clusters. And in this case, we're looking at the globular clusters M10 and M15. The M indicates just uh, what catalog they are a part of. They are a part of the Messier catalog. Um, it's just something that astronomers use to help keep track of how things are labeled in the sky. And these two are, once again, Hubble photos, because like I said, if you're going to study star clusters, Hubble is the backbone of that uh, science. So you can see the two very different shapes that clusters can come in, these sort of diffuse open clusters and these very dense uh, globular clusters. So that's what the two types of clusters look like. Now, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen because Katie, I've kept us on Earth and I've only been showing us pictures of space. So let's go into space. So Katie is using a program called Open Space, which is another free open source program. This one is a little bit of a beast, I will say. You can download and use this um, program if you want. It is a bit of a beast. It will eat up all your computer memory. <laughs> And right now she has us hanging outside the solar system. So what we're looking at here is at the very center, you've got our sun uh, and the orbits of the four inner planets very, very close together. Uh, and then a bit more spread out those outer planets. And what we're going to do right now is we're going to leave our solar system behind because our sun is not part of a star cluster. So if we're going to go talk about star clusters, we need to leave our solar system behind. Head out into interstellar space. And as we do, we're heading out amongst the stars. And what I'm going to have Katie do is one of the great things about this program, Open Space, is that it's got a lot of different data sets that you can use. So Katie, first of all, uh, I'm going to say let's first put up the globular clusters. So she's going to mark where the globular clusters are. So all those yellow dots are globular clusters that we've mapped. Um, and you can, we're going to just sort of spin around, take a look at where they are, where you see them distributed. And now, Katie, let's go ahead and add um, the data set of open clusters. So the yellow dots are still going to be the globular clusters. The green ones are the open clusters. And now I have a question for all of you. What do you notice about their distributions? It can be any observation that you're making about the way the green dots are distributed, the way the yellow dots are distributed, the way they compare to each other, anything that you observe about it, go ahead and put it in the Q&A. All right, we're going to give our folks a moment to get their observations in, but they're starting to come in. So it looks like some folks are saying the green dots look a little more linear. Another person says all of them kind of look roughly like they're in a line. Another person saying that the open clusters are in a line or that the green dots seem to be more linear than the yellow ones. 
Yes, these are wonderful observations. So they're not distributed the same way. The green dots are very much confined to, uh, much more confined to a specific region. Um, and then you see the yellow dots both in that region and above and below it. And does anybody wanna guess what that region is? What that area of space represents where the open clusters are gathered together. You can put your answer in the Q&A. If you don't know, if you haven't got a guess, you can go ahead and put question marks because one of the great things about science is that we don't know everything. And one of the important things about science is being able to admit what we don't know. So go ahead and put a guess in if you have one, feel free to put question marks. We, we do have a lot of question marks, Talia, but we have a couple of guesses here too. Um, one person said maybe the Kuiper belt, another person said maybe the cluster belt, some kind of belt, um, and maybe the Milky Way. So those are the main guesses we have right now. Excellent. And that last one is correct. That line that you sort of see the green markers distributed around, that is the plane of the Milky Way. Our Milky Way is a disk. It's a disc shaped galaxy. So when we're looking at it from the inside like this, we see it as a line that sort of goes around us. And that line is where these green dots are mostly lining up. So that tells us that you're gonna find open clusters mostly inside the galaxy within the disc of the Milky Way. The open or the globular clusters, the yellow dots are a little more widely distributed, but they all tend, there tends to, seems to be a heck of a lot more of them in the direction we're looking now, which is towards the center of the Milky Way. So that tells us that they're really not in the disk of the Milky Way. And the fact that there's more, we see them more around, closer to the center tells us that they are actually orbiting the Milky Way. They're just outside the Milky Way orbiting it. And that's because although these are both called star clusters, they are two very different things and they have very different origins. And they last for very different amounts of time. So the reason why all those open clusters are in the disk of the Milky Way is actually because they come from star formation they have to do with the way stars form. So stars form out of giant clouds of gas and dust that we call nebulas, star birth nebulas or star forming nebulas. And that, that nebula essentially gets eaten up by the cluster of stars that it's making. So eventually the nebula is gone. The nebula has just been completely eaten up. It's been totally turned into brand new baby stars. And what's left are the stars themselves. And they are all close together because they were all born from the same nebula. And that is essentially what an open cluster is. I'm gonna steal the screen share just for a moment, Katie, to go back and show again uh, the image of the Pleiades from Hubble. So this is a cluster of several dozen young stars. And you can tell they're young because there's a lot of blue ones. Blue stars don't live very long. So if for there to be so many blue stars there, you know this can't be that old. And open clusters tend to not be very old. You can see some of the wisps of gas that we noticed earlier. That's what's left over from the nebula that gave birth to these stars. So when you look at the Pleiades in the night sky, you're actually looking at the what was left of a stellar nursery, a, places, a place where stars were born. And most stars, at one point early in their history will belong to an open cluster like this. We think our sun probably was born into a cluster like this. So I said our sun isn't part of one of these clusters. I should have said our sun's not part of one of these clusters now. It probably was very early in its history. And that's another reason why you don't see open clusters that are very old because these stars are drifting away from each other. Our sun drifted away from the cluster it was born into. Um, the other stars in the cluster have also drifted away, the sun's siblings. We're not 100% sure where any of them are, actually. And that's what's gonna happen to the Pleiades over time. These stars are going to drift apart. So you don't tend to see old uh, open clusters. 
which is why you can have so many young blue stars in them. Now I'm gonna take another moment to compare that to the globular clusters. So once again, besides the shape, which is pretty different, what do you notice is different about the open clusters versus the globular clusters? And I'll flip back and forth between the pictures while you guys write your observations in the Q&A. So there's the globulars and the open ones. Again, we know density of stars obviously is a very big difference, but what else do you notice? All right, we're giving everyone a chance to write their observations in the chat again. Um, sorry, I'm trying to, to navigate through all the questions too. We've got quite a few of them today, Talia. Okay, but, One, but I'll, I'll have a break for questions in a bit, I promise. Sounds good. Um, but now I can start to see some of those observations. So um, some folks are saying, that they're not they're not as blue maybe as some of the other ones they saw today. Someone else said glob the globular looks more dense and maybe more colorful. The open clusters seem to have more blue stars. They're really focusing in on the color. Um, and then Zachary H8 says there are thousands, maybe millions of globs. <laughs> Very good, all very good observations. And the color is a great observation because if you look at these globular clusters, you're seeing a lot of red dots here. You're seeing a lot of red stars, um, a lot fewer blue stars. Whereas when you were looking at the open clusters, you're seeing a lot more blue stars in there. And I, I, like I said, um, blue stars don't live very long. So the fact that there are so many blue stars in the, in the open clusters tells us they're young. The fact that there aren't very many in the globular clusters tells us that they must be older. And to talk about the globular clusters, Katie, let's go ahead and exit the Milky Way. So we've talked about the open clusters and where they come from and why there are so many in the disk of the Milky Way. Globular clusters are a completely different story. Globular clusters are very, very old or can be very, very old. And you'd see them orbiting galaxies. They're orbiting the center of the Milky Way. They're not in the galaxy, they're orbiting it. And most galaxies will have groups of these globular clusters around them orbiting them. And again, we know that really thanks to Hubble. Hubble has managed to observe globular clusters orbiting galaxies really, really, really far away from us. And we're not 100% sure how they all form, but some of them are older than the galaxies they orbit. We found one recently orbiting our nearest large neighbor, Andromeda, and it's older than Andromeda. So we think at least some of these globular clusters, one way that we know galaxies get bigger is by eating smaller galaxies or smaller galaxies combining together, or in this case, uh, a larger galaxy stripping away every bit of a, a smaller galaxy and making it part of itself. But a lot of galaxies are denser in the middle, more stars in the middle of that galaxy, but means the gravity between those stars is a little stronger. It's a little hard to pull them apart from each other. So one theory is that these globular clusters are actually the remnants of smaller galaxies that the Milky Way pulled apart and made a part of itself. Uh, and that's, we know that our galaxy has grown that way over time. Uh, and it's possible that these are the centers of those galaxies that were just too dense, too closely held together by gravity to be pulled apart. And so now they're sort of part of the Milky Way. They're orbiting it. And like I said, we see this in many galaxies and we know that this is how galaxies can grow. So it kind of makes sense. And uh, like I said, a lot of these stars are very, very, very old. And one thing we don't know is because these, um, these are very old stars, we wonder if uh, there could be planets in those clusters. We wonder about, uh, could there be a lot of black holes in those clusters, things like that. And once again, if you're gonna ask those questions, you really gotta talk about Hubble. Hubble is the only telescope that has managed to confirm the presence of black holes in some of these clusters. Um, which is pretty cool because you've got hundreds or thousands or millions of stars packed within something maybe only a hundred light years wide. 
So the presence of black holes in that environment can be very interesting. As for planets, we're not sure. We think maybe, maybe we found a planet in one of these clusters. We're not sure. It's actually really hard to find planets amidst so many stars because you have to look for them indirectly. And the effect a planet has on its star is a lot less noticeable when there's a thousand other stars really close together. So these are very unique environments and I'm gonna go ahead and stop and take questions. I can see the number of questions keeps going up. The number of things in the Q and A keeps going up, Christina. So uh, let's go ahead. Awesome, thank you, Talia. Well, I'm, and luckily there's some trends in these questions. So okay. you can kind of like synthesize some of them. Um, but I think two questions that keep coming up about the clusters is whether we have a sense of how many there are, but also if one type of cluster, like an open cluster, can turn into a different type of cluster, like a globular. Hmm. Okay, so um, in terms of numbers, um, there are many, I'm gonna go with thousands of open clusters that we know about in the Milky Way. There's a much smaller number of globular clusters that we know about orbiting the Milky Way. It's something around 100 and 150, somewhere around 150 globular clusters are known to orbit the Milky Way. And like I said, that's orbiting the Milky Way. Uh, other galaxies will have their own sort of halos of globular clusters and an unknown number of open clusters within them. As to how one can, if one can turn into the other, well, sort of. All of those stars in the globular clusters had to be born at some point, and they were probably born in open clusters. Now those open clusters will then probably come apart and then eventually those stars became part of globular clusters. But in some cases, those open clusters may even have formed the seeds for the um, centers of the galaxies that eventually got eaten by the Milky Way and their center became a globular cluster. So technically, since most stars are born in open clusters, every star that is now part of a globular cluster, probably was a part of an open cluster at one point uh, in its life. Awesome, thank you, Talia. Um, and I think maybe we could use a little bit of clarification in terms of the relationship between star clusters and planets. There mm -hmm. seems to be a, a few people who are wondering if the star clusters are what form planets. So maybe you could clarify mm -hmm. there okay. a little bit. Yes, so a planet uh, is an object uh, that is, it's something that has to orbit a star. What a star cluster is, is many, 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 many stars. A couple dozen to maybe a hundred with an open cluster, hundreds to millions in a globular cluster. So these things are way bigger than a planet. Uh, for instance, uh, a globular cluster can have millions of times the mass of our sun in it, just in stars, uh, whereas a planet is going to be smaller than our sun. So a planet is a tiny, 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 tiny thing compared to a star even, and then globular clusters are millions of stars or thousands of stars, and then open clusters are also large groups of stars. Now, those that doesn't mean those stars can't have planets, uh, obviously. Uh, stars in open clusters can have planets because that's how our, our solar system started out. So fortunately, being in an open cluster has no particular effect on your ability to have planets, but globular clusters, it's a lot harder. There's a lot more gravitational forces going on at work there. I hope that cleared things up. I hope so too. <laughs> that, that made sense to me. Um, and we have a couple of questions about telescopes. Um, kind of linking them together, there was a question about whether you thought the James Webb telescope could be used to observe clusters, but then also thinking about those big telescopes like James Webb and Hub, like obviously the average person isn't going to have that in their house. So do you have any recommendations for a telescope the average person might want to use? Yeah, so James Webb is gonna be great at this, but James Webb is gonna be able to see farther uh, than Hubble and hopefully, um, is going to be able to see some of these globular clusters farther into towards the edge of the visible universe. There's another telescope that is um, being built right now, which is also hopefully going to be good for this. 
uh, W first, the wide field infrared survey telescope is currently being built. It's hopefully also going to be very good at this. In terms of um, a telescope that an average person can use, um, I say the best telescope you can buy is the one you're gonna use, which is probably going to be one that's not super heavy or super complicated. Um, for if you're wondering about a telescope that can help you observe clusters, you don't need much. A pair of binoculars can help you find some of these globular clusters in the night sky. Uh, and like I said, the Pleiades and the Hyades, you can see with your eyes. Um, but that's sort of my always guiding principle in terms of te telling people how to look for a telescope is it's the one you're going to use. You're probably not going to use one that's really heavy uh, or really complicated to use. So look for one, especially if it's your first telescope, look for one that's kind of basic and doesn't have a huge um, lens or mirror because that's going to drive the weight up. And you don't need a huge lens or mirror to be able to see things like these clusters or planets in the sky or the Orion Nebula. Like there's all sorts of things you can see through even a small telescope. Cool. Maybe I'll, I'll end with one last sort of trend in questions, Talia, and that has to do with light. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be a thread here related to whether stars ever lose their light or why do some stars disappear and others don't? That's a great question. Uh, what happens is stars have fuel inside of them that they're, they're fusing together, um, mostly hydrogen gas. Um, and when they run out of fuel, they that's the end of the star. Um, what happens when they run out of fuel depends on how massive a star is. If for the really massive stars, they explode. And that's what a supernova is. Uh, for stars like the sun, a quieter, prettier, more complicated process happens, uh, leading to a different kind of nebula, a very pretty kind called a planetary nebula. Um, so when we say like the stars don't live very long or, you know, the blue stars in the globular clusters are gone, it means they ran out of fuel a long time ago. Um, and the ones that are still burning are the smaller yellow and red stars that take a lot longer to go through their fuel. A really bright blue star, a really big blue star might run through its fuel in only a few million years. Our sun, which is a mid-sized star, is going to take about 10 billion years all told to run through its fuel. It's about halfway through that. Uh, and then there are small red stars, dim red stars that are going to take trillions of years to run through their fuel. So that's what we mean when we say stars go away. It means they ran out of fuel. <coughs> awesome. Thank you, Talia. Um, did you want to show us any last thing before we have to wrap up here? I, I don't think so. I got through most of what I wanted to say, and then the questions were just really, really good and exciting. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm going to come here. I don't want to steal anyone's thunder. And I want to thank <laughs> Talia and I want to thank Katie for being such amazing educators today. We're going to go ahead and say goodbye. Bye, everybody. Happy holidays. And I want to thank everyone who tuned in today for joining the program. You all had so many great questions and it looked like we had at least one classroom joining in with us today. So we were so happy to have you and thank you for making so many great observations and questions. We are sorry that we couldn't get to all of them because we did have a big group today. But if you'd like another chance to ask questions about space or about other topics, you can do so by checking out our other upcoming offerings on our website at mos.org slash mos at home. Also, if you enjoyed the program and you would like to support the Museum of Science, you can learn more about how to do that by visiting our website at engage.mos.org slash welcome. And if you'd like to check out the software we use for our program today by yourself at home and look for other things in space or maybe dive more into different kinds of clusters, you can do so by visiting openspaceproject.com, which has the link on the screen here. But thank you all for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at the next one.